Hello and welcome to this Rygate Grammar School Biology Department video on lung structure and function and we are aiming this at AS level. Structure and function in biology are always very closely linked. When you see a structure it will be that shape and have that structure because that structure allows it to perform a function. Remember these structures have been honed by countless generations of natural selection and therefore they are now very efficient at performing their function. So we're going to think about lung structure and how this structure gives it the functions it has. This is the human respiratory system and in it are of course the lungs. Now the respiratory system is a big machine to ventilate the alveoli. We've got the lungs themselves with the diaphragm, the ribs, the intercostal muscles, all these things. They're really just part of a big machine to ventilate the alveoli. The lungs themselves in humans have got a massive surface area, a surface area of 50 to 80 meters squared. We normally talk in terms of tennis courts uh, when we're talking about the surface area of the lungs. So they cover a tennis court. And with a volume of only 6 dm cubed, that's 6 liters, you can see that our surface area to volume ratio is very, very high. Now mammals do have high surface area to volume ratios. Now I've called it surface area to mass ratio here. Of course mass and volume are pretty much equivalent in organisms with a density of just under 1 gram per cm cubed. Let's have a look at some of them. So humans, we for every gram of our body, we have 7 centimeters squared of lung which sounds pretty big to me. Seals nearly twice that 13 centimeters squared per gram of their tissue. Why do seals need more? They need to do gas exchange very efficiently because as diving animals they've got to be able to oxygenate their blood and remove carbon dioxide from their blood very efficiently. Bats all the more so. Look at that massive total there. In part this is because bats themselves are very light and therefore they don't weigh very much and therefore you're not dividing it by quite so much but of course they're extremely metabolically active as they are flyers and flying is very energetically expensive. Other vertebrates, fish, fish of course have gills so we're not going to worry about their lungs but reptiles and amphibians they have slightly different lung structure to us their lungs are a bit more basic really than ours. Uh, why so? Well they are ectotherms and as such they don't expend a lot of energy heating their bodies by simply respiring all their glucose away and converting the chemical energy in glucose into heat energy. Therefore they do not need such efficient gas exchange because they don't need to pick up so much oxygen, they don't need to excrete so much CO2. So their lungs are a little bit simpler than ours. Birds we can draw a contrast with birds because birds, they are even more complicated than we are. They've got various different lobes all over the place and we're not going to worry about them too much other than to say, well done birds, you've got fabulous lungs. Let's look at the ultrastructure. By that we mean getting down to the nitty gritty of what goes on on the small level. The lungs deliver constant ventilation to the alveoli and each alveolus is itself tiny, about 100 micrometers in diameter, that's one tenth of a millimeter. That gives each alveolus a huge surface area to volume ratio, giving us a total surface area for the lungs, which as we've said is very, very large. Also very important is the blood supply to it. We need the capillary bed to be very dense, covering a lot of the surface area of the alveoli, otherwise all this surface area we generate by having these alveoli will be wasted if we're not wrapping them up in capillaries. So a closer look at the alveolar epithelium itself. Key words to start off with. Epithelium. An epithelium is a layer of cells separating body tissues from the environment. Where does that happen here? Well the lumen of the alveolus, I'm just going to write lumen up here, is outside the body. There's nothing separating the lumen of the alveolus from the atmosphere itself, so that counts as being the environment. So where is the epithelium here? Well, it's this layer of cells here, separating the body from the environment. So this is epithelium. This is an epithelial cell here. What is endothelium? Endothelium is a layer of cells separating the blood from the tissues. So what is that? That's this cell here. The cells which make up the blood capillary, which I'm 
very poorly drawing around here. Those are endothelial cells. Now there is a complication to that because foolishly we've decided to name any thin and flat cell at an exchange surface a squamous epithelium cell. Now that doesn't really help anyone. So there we go. Not only is an endothelial cell, and I'm going to write it up here and point to it, these cells lining the capillaries, not only is an endothelial cell an endothelial cell, it is also a squamous epithelial cell. Well, uh, yes, that is a little bit unnecessarily complicated, but there we go. We also have here an epithelial cell which produces surfactant. A quick word on surfactant. There is, as we've described, a huge surface area in the alveoli. Now water has a strong surface tension. Surface tension pulls surfaces together. So this surface will be pulled together this way by the surface tension of the water. You know this if you try and pull a bit of tissue paper apart after you've made it wet and squeezed it. As you try to pull it apart it just rips and tears because the surface tension is holding the fibres together. If you want to inflate your lungs you're going to have to get rid of that surface tension and surfactant here lowers surface tension. Now that lowering of surface tension allows us to inflate our lungs properly and if you are a premature baby then you struggle with this because if you were born too early you were born before your surfactant producing cells start working properly and therefore you don't produce enough surfactant and therefore your lungs don't inflate properly and that becomes very problematic. Okay, we need to think about Fick's law and how the alveolar structure maximizes the rate of diffusion. Let's start by writing out Fick's law. Fick's law states that the rate of diffusion is proportional to the concentration gradient multiplied by the surface area divided by the diffusion distance. So any way we can make the numbers on the top larger and the number on the bottom smaller then we can speed up the rate of diffusion. So let's start off with surface area. That should be pretty easy. Each alveolus being tiny and having a large surface area generates a large total surface area of the lungs. Let's put them in categories here. How do we change our surface area? Each alveolus has a large SA. Good. That's our main surface area adaptation. Our lungs are pretty good at doing that. Right, next. Conch grad, our concentration gradient. How can we make sure that we've got a high concentration on one part and a low concentration on the other side of a membrane to speed up our rate of diffusion? Primarily, this is done by keeping things moving. So, on the one part, we ventilate our alveoli. We do this by inhaling and exhaling. And that keeps a high concentration of oxygen in the alveoli and a low concentration of CO2 in the alveoli. That keeps a high concentration gradient. Next point is we circulate. So the blood in these capillaries keeps moving through. It doesn't stay where it is and therefore we bring blood with low concentration of oxygen and high concentration of CO2 maintaining a high concentration gradient all the time. So we've got high O2 in here and we've got low O2 if you can read it uh, down there and we also want to think about uh, high, I'm just going to put an arrow, high CO2 and low CO2 uh, in the alveolus. So that gives us a large concentration gradient, ventilating and circulating. And then the last one is something we want to be small, that's the diffusion distance. And to make sure this is small, we're using squamous Epithelial cells. You knew there was a reason we spoke about them, didn't you? Therefore, we are reducing this distance here by using two squamous epithelial cells to provide our barrier between the atmosphere and our blood. So, rate of diffusion is going to be fast. We also want to think about the structure of other parts of the lungs. We want to think about the bronchioles, the bronchioles, the trachea. 
Their job is simply to deliver air to the alveoli. Gas exchange itself does not occur in these airways. You can consider the volume of air inside each one to be dead space. So let's look at each structure one by one. We've got smooth muscle here, and we've got elastic fibers here. These work antagonistically. That means they work in opposite directions to each other. So smooth muscle, that is able to contract, to narrow the airwaves. Maybe there are toxins around, you narrow the airwaves, so fewer of the toxins get into your airwaves. And then if the smooth muscle relaxes after that, the elastic fibers will recoil, opening up those airways again. We also have goblet cells. These goblet cells put out mucus to line the bronchi and the bronchioles. That mucus can then trap bacteria and other particles such as that. And then we have our ciliated epithelium and they will waft our mucus with all its trapped bacteria up, up and away out to the back of the throat and then you can kind of hoik it up and swallow it down and then any bacteria in it will be killed by your stomach acid. Other things that we have is cartilage. Now there is an amount of cartilage in the bronchioles uh, but particularly the lot in the bronchi and the trachea. The cartilage is just structural support. We've got to keep it open. If your airways close up and then you can't provide air to your alveoli, then you can, therefore you're going to lose your concentration gradient and therefore you're not going to do any effective gas exchange. All bad news. So cartilage is there to hold it open. Note they are C-shaped. and You can see that rather nicely here. All of these tissues need to be supplied with blood themselves, so we have blood vessels there. That blood vessel, uh, we expect, would also branch off and then wrap around an alveolus, and then we'd do a bit of gas exchange around there. Here we have these mucus-secreting glands, and they are full of goblet cells. As a little test, what is this? Well, you've guessed it, this is ciliated epithelium. And what can you spot here? Have a little look to see what you can see. What structures can you recognize? Okay, let's start labeling things as we can. This layer here, these are our cilia. And these structures here, here is one, there it is. That is a ciliated epithelial cell. Notice that it's very different from your squamous epithelial cells, which are thin and flat. This one is much taller. It doesn't have such a huge surface area. It's not doing gas exchange. This around here, now if you look carefully, you can just about make out that you have these sort of trapezium type shapes here. These are smooth muscle cells. And this structure here, well, that is a great big lump of cartilage designed to hold it open. And interspersed, you've got all these elastic fibers around here, which you can see, all sorts of connective tissue as well. And in here, this is the lumen. Right, before we finish off, I want you to see if you can do these things. Can you describe the ultrastructure of an alveolus, linking the structures to maximizing diffusion of gases? You're going to need to think about fixed law when you do that. Can you, from memory, describe the tissues in bronchioles and bronchi and discuss the function of each? And in doing that, you're going to need to link it, of course, to its structure. And can you identify different tissues from images? There we go. I hope that's helped.